Okay, so um, we're moving the Virginia Wolf uh, to next time, as I said over um, the email of the weekend, right? Uh, because one of our presenters uh, couldn't be here today uh, due to circumstances beyond his control. So um, <clears throat> Hannah and Aaron will be doing their presentation on Wednesday on Virginia Wolf. Um, I am also going to give everybody this afternoon um, a template for the annotated bibliography, right? I'll send you a sample version because um, I think most of you said you've done something like this before. I know that you have and that you have. Um, you have not. Okay. So even if you've done it before, it still helps to have a model to work from, right? So um, I will send everybody a model when I get back to my office after class. Um, Five sentences, fresh words, like at least five. Yeah, 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 roughly, yeah, roughly five sentences, yeah, yeah. What? Pardon? What? For the annotated bibliography. So um, essentially what an annotated bibliography is, right, is you're giving me a, the, you know, you're giving me the, the sources that you're going you're to use for your paper, right? So it's like a regular works cited page, but after each source listing, you're giving me a paragraph that describes that source, right? That tells me a little bit about it. So you're telling me a little bit about uh, what the basic argument is, um, you know, where it fits into scholarly conversations about this topic, and also um, who, the, uh, who the author is and what their credentials are. So those are the big things that I want here. And, that's, and that's, I think that's all on the assignment sheet. But yeah, when you see what one looks like, it'll give you a better sense of what I'm asking for. And for the final, uh -huh. like what all is on the final? Is it just gonna be, is it gonna be like the midterm or? Yeah, the final will be very similar to the midterm. It will be cumulative, so there will be some stuff from the first half of the semester, right? Um, well, you know, cause you, know, you, you can't just, you know, forget that stuff once midterm comes, right? Um, but it'll be asking you mostly to connect that stuff to stuff that we've been talking about in the second half of the course, right? Which we've been doing in our class sessions anyway. So, um, yeah, uh, I sent everybody the sample questions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you should have got those by email, right? Um, and for the couple of weeks in which we're not doing vocabulary quizzes, I will give you a list of terms that I want you to know. So, you know, you don't have to take the quizzes anymore, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you um, a list of terms for the last, like, maybe two or three weeks that I will expect everyone to, to know for the exam. Like, what definitions or we're going to have to look up the definitions? Um, you'll have to look up the definitions, but you won't be quizzed on them. However, they, you know, they might appear on the exam. But most of what's going to be on the exam, you can go back through the old vocab quizzes and look at look at those. So like what is the exam? Is it like the exact same format as the midterm? It will be, yeah, it'll be the same format, but because it's two hours, it'll be a little longer, right? So instead of answering one essay question in 500 words, you're going to answer two. And instead of doing um, eight IDs, you'll do ten. Like, like Pardon? Like both ideas about 500 or 500 total? Like with the two ideas? Both, both essays will be 500 words. Okay. You scared me. I'm like, that's a thousand words. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, that, that's what I mean. Yeah, is it'll be a thousand words total. Yeah. And we only have two hours? Yeah, you have, you have two hours for the exam. Yep. And you know, like, believe, like, you know, th th this, this has, you know, in the past generally not been a huge problem for people. Or like, people, people meet the word limits. It's, you know, if they weren't, then I would rethink what I was what I was doing, and I would give a different exam. But I'm yeah. not really worried about the word, but like getting all of the content down. Uh huh. Like saying everything I need to say. Okay. Well, and it, it, I, I think that like what might help you then is like work with you know work with the sample questions a little bit, and do some outlining, right? So like you know before um, you know like when you sit down to the exam, before you actually write anything in the exam book. Do a little bit of outlining of the essays on the exam sheet that I give you, right? It's like, okay, I wanna make sure I say this, I wanna make sure I say this, I wanna make sure I say this. And I think what you need to do is just make sure that you focus on like what the most important things you need to say are about this thing, right? 
don't, don't worry about covering everything. Right? I'm not expecting everybody to cover everything. Just do, do the best you can to answer the question. Any other questions about the exam or about the final paper or anything else that's coming up? Do you know what day it is? Off the top of my head, no, but it's on the syllabus. In fact, I can, I can look that up. Uh, I can look that up right now. Hold on. I think it's relatively late in the week. It's for some reason, all of my exam periods ended up late in the week, and I don't know why. Oh, it's not, yeah, it's not on the syllabus. Okay, well then. Right, because they were really late establishing the exam dates this year, and I had to get that uploaded. So let's see, final exam schedule. Uh, we meet 11 to 12.15 on Mondays and Wednesdays. Okay, so our exam is going to be Thursday the 13th. From 10.30 to 12.30. How classes ended on the 10th? What's that? How about classes ended on the 10th? Classes do end on the 10th. The exam period is after classes end. So yeah, the, the, our last class is the 10th. And uh, the 10th, you'll notice on the syllabus I've reserved for um, a review day, right? So <laughs> any questions you have about the test, any questions you have about the course material, right? You'll have a chance to ask me those questions on the 10th. Any other questions about final assignments or anything. How many more reading courses do we have? Um, I believe there are, um, I believe there are two more. Um, and I will admit that I do kind of stack them at the end of the semester a little bit to keep people from slacking off. Okay, so let's talk about Gene Reese. How did the story go for you? What did you guys think? It was very interesting. I like how it tackles um, the narrator and her friend Eddie's like identity. Okay. And since like they they don't exactly fit in. Okay. In what ways do they not fit in? Like, what's questionable about their identities? What's that? Yeah, in fact, the narrator isn't black at all, right? So the narrator. Yeah, she's white, but she's not regarded as fully English, right? I think, yeah, uh, it, it will be interesting to compare the way she negotiates this, right, to the way her friend Eddie negotiates his um, identity, right? So what's Eddie's identity? Yeah, Eddie is mixed race, right? Yeah, half caste is a term that was often used in British colonial contexts um, offensively to describe someone who was of mixed race, right? So to call someone a half caste or to be called a half caste um, is considered offensive, right? So Eddie, yeah, Eddie is mixed race. The narrator is white, but clearly kind of like not, is not treated by the English as being fully English, right? Um, in fact, um, does anybody remember what it is the other the English children call her when they remind her that she's not English? You're a whore at calling English. 
Yeah, they call her a horrid colonial. The idea here being that even the, the English people of these outer colonies, right, cannot themselves be reassimilated into, um, <clears throat> into Englishness, right? That they are marked as different by having grown up in the colonies, right? I don't know, I found like the fallen woman, that's what I like relate it to because people thought fallen women could be reintegrated into society because they were marked as like dirty. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it, it is, yeah, a kind of similar notion of almost like someone being tainted, right? That um, you know you, you can't uh, you know you can't wipe the dust off of the care of the Caribbean off of you, right? Um, and it's worth noting also that even though um, at the time Reese was writing in the uh, I believe she wrote the story in the 1940s. Okay, the story was first published in 1960, so this might have been after. Independence. When she was growing up on the island of Dominica, Dominica was still a British colony, right? However, the number of British people on Dominica and on other islands like it was always quite small. So, to give you some sense of where we're talking about. Does anybody know where Dominica is? Kind of. Okay. Southeast uh, of the Caribbean. Yeah, it's in the Southeast Caribbean. Yeah, it's like off the coast of South America, right? So um, I'm going to show you actually exactly where it is. Um, and it is not to be confused with the Dominican Republic. Right, which occupies half of the large island of Hispaniola, right? The other half being occupied by Haiti. The Dominican Republic was the Spanish half of Hispaniola. Haiti was the French half, right? Dominica is over here. So it's kind of far from the center of the Caribbean, um, far from the larger trading ports of Jamaica and Cuba and Haiti and the Dominican Republic, um, Puerto Rico. And it's in the middle of this chain of islands, um, the northern half of which is called the Leeward Islands and the southern half of which is called the Windward Islands. Does anybody know what Leeward and Windward mean? No. All right, I didn't think so. These are nautical terms. So Leeward is a location that is downwind of your point of reference. And windward is upwind of your point of reference. And Dominica is sometimes regarded as the southernmost of the Leeward Islands and sometimes regarded as the northernmost of the Windward Islands, right? Because it is right in the middle of the chain there, right? But yeah, these islands are tiny. Um, some of them were French colonies. Some of them were Spanish colonies. Some of them were English colonies. Most of them changed hands various times over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, they are just about all independent nations now. Um, their economies are predominantly dependent on tourism. Right? These are you know, places that people come for a vacation. In part because they're really kind of, they're too small to produce much of anything. So <clears throat> Yeah, one of the things that makes identity a difficult and fraught concept 
for both the narrator and Eddie, right, is that neither of them fit into the majority population of Dominica, right? They're both marked as different in various ways. And I want to uh, go to um, page 724 for a second, you know, like around where they talk about the narrator being a hard colonial. Can I get somebody to read that first full paragraph for us? Um, starting with it was Eddie with the pale blue eyes and straw colored hair. Uh, page 724. It was Eddie with pale blue eyes and straw colored hair, the living image of his father, the often as silent as his mother, who first infected me with doubts of thought, meaning England. He would be so quiet when others <clears throat> who had never seen it, none of us had ever seen it, were talking about it so lights. Yes. Really, as I talk, London, the beautiful rosy cheeked ladies, the theaters, the shops, the fog, the blazing coals in the winter, the exotic food, white bait, eaten to the sound of the violins, strawberries and cream, the word strawberries always spoken with a guttural and throaty sound, which we imagine to be proper English pronunciation. Keep going. Keep going, yep. I don't like strawberries, Eddie said on one occasion. You don't like strawberries? No, and I don't like daffodils either. Dad's always going on about them. He says they lick the flowers here into a cracked hat, and I bet that's a lie. We were also shocked to say, you don't know anything about it. We were so shocked that nobody spoke to him for the rest of the day. But I, for one, admire him. I was also tired of learning and reciting poems in praise of daffodils, and my relations with the few real English boys and girls I had met were awkward. I had discovered that if I called myself English, they would snub me heartily. You're not English, you're a horror colonial. Well, I don't want much to be English, I would say. It's much more fun to be French or Spanish or something like that. And as a matter of fact, I am a bit. Then I was too killingly funny, quite ridiculous. Not only a horror colonial, but also, but also ridiculous. Heads I win, toes you lose. That was the English. I had thought all about this and I had thought hard, but I had never dared to tell anybody what I thought and I realized Eddie had been very bold. Okay, thank you. So. Let's think about for a second this idea of home, right? What is their idea of home here? Right? What place do they think of or talk about as home? England? Yeah, home is England. And what's ironic about their notion of England as home? Never even been. Yeah, they've never been there. They've never been there, they've never seen it. And what does their idea of home look like? Like what what do they what sorts of things do they imagine as English? The rosy cheeked women. Okay, rosy cheeked women. Good. Right? Rosie being the kind of reaction that white people's cheeks get in the cold, right? What else? Daffodils. Daffodils. Right? English poets always going on about their damn daffodils, right? Strawberries and cream. Strawberries and cream, yeah. fog and coal fires, right? Right, all of these things that are by and large completely alien to a Caribbean upbringing, right? It doesn't get cold enough that you need a coal fire. It's not especially foggy, although hurricanes are a common occurrence, right? Um, and Daffodils and strawberries are not to be found. So they talk about how beautiful the daffodils are and how much they love strawberries and cream without ever having tasted strawberries and cream, right? So <clears throat> when Eddie says he doesn't like strawberries, 
Well, how does he know, right? When the other children say, you don't like strawberries, well, how do they know, right? They've constructed this whole notion of identity that's based on a kind of cultural memory, right? That's one that they don't personally share. It's, you know, their parents' and grandparents' cultural memories. But I think with Eddie, it's also important to think about who he, who he associates strawberries and daffodils with. That's that. Yeah. For him, strawberries and daffodils, these are things that his father is always going on about. And what do we know about Mr. Sawyer? What information does the story give us about him? What's that? He's an asshole. Okay, yeah. <laughs> he is not a pleasant person, right? Because he's not a gentleman. What's that? Because he's not a gentleman. Okay, does everybody understand what that means, that he's not a gentleman? I'm happy to do. Okay, um, Nick, you're, you're, what's that? I assume like he didn't have like a, um, I don't know how to explain it. Like I kind of got it, but like I don't know how to put it into words. Okay. In a British context, right, think a class context here, right? What does it mean to be a gentleman? Like an upperclassman? Yes. Because they didn't say, like, you could tell by the way he talked in the lower class. Uh-huh. Yeah. If we look, all right, if we look on page 723, right? His father, Mr. Sawyer, was a strange man. Nobody could make out what he was doing in our part of the world at all. He was not a planter or a doctor or a lawyer or a banker. He didn't keep a store. He wasn't a schoolmaster or a government official. He wasn't, that was the point, a gentleman. We had several resident romantics who had fallen in love with the moon on the Caribbean. They were all gentlemen quite unlike Mr. Sawyer, who hadn't an H in his composition. Besides, he detested the moon and everything else about the Caribbean, and he didn't mind telling you so. So, yeah, his pronunciation, the fact that he drops his H's, indicates a working class background. And how is he then compared to the gentlemen who've come to settle on Dominica? What are the gentlemen who come to settle on Dominica doing it for? Money. Well, is it money that's bringing the, the gentleman here? Um, who, 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 is, who is he being? He, we know he's, he's not somebody who's here to make money, apparently. But he's also not one of these resident romantics, right? So the idea here is that these gentlemen who come to Dominica, right, do so because they fall in love with the landscape, right? Or, you know, with the, they, they, you know, imbibe the romance of the place in some way, right? Like yeah. I mean, if you think of a gentleman as, you know, someone with a private income um, who doesn't really need to work for a living, right? They can pretty much set up and live where the fuck they want, right? And these are people who are choosing the Caribbean. They're choosing Dominica because they find the place beautiful, right? They're, stri they're stricken by the moon or by the flowers or something, right? So, yeah, so they settle for romantic capital R or for sentimental reasons. But there doesn't seem to be an ounce of sentiment in Mr. Sawyer, right? What else, what do we know about his attitude towards the Caribbean? He hates it, and all that stuff about it. Yeah, he very publicly detests Dominica, right?
Now, what about his job? What, is, what does he actually do for a living? Can I get somebody to read that paragraph on page 723, uh, the second one from the top? He was agent for a small steamship line, which in those days linked up Venezuela and Trinidad with the smaller islands, but he could not make much of that. Okay, so let's think for a second. Um, okay, so what does he do? Yeah, essentially, yeah, he um, agent for a steamship line. Um, what this means is that he essentially um, like books passengers and cargo on steamships, right? That are going between these islands and the mainland. So. What he does here is actually a little bit reminiscent of the Atlantic Trade Triangle, right? Moving people and goods from the islands to the mainland. And what other two facts are important about Mr. Sawyer? Yeah, he's frequently drunk and he, at the very least, verbally abuses his wife, right? Well, one point he physically abuses he pulls on her hair. Yeah, he pulls her hair, yeah. And pulls it out. Yeah. And let's put Mrs. Sawyer to the side here to discuss in a minute, right? But what is the other thing that's important to the story that Mr. Sawyer has been doing? Oh, books. Yeah, he's been collecting books, right? Even though he doesn't seem like someone who is particularly educated or much of a reader, right? And I think it is probably worth looking at the titles of several of the books that he's been collecting, right? On page 725, what do we know about his book collection as Mrs. Sawyer and the maid are gathering them up? Yeah, almost all of them are about, we got Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, he must have got them from England, like he collected them from England. Yeah, he has been ordering them from England, right? But we also know that because he hates the Caribbean, right? And he has been promoting to his son these different markers of British cultural identity, right? The daffodils and the strawberries and all that. Um, that he does seem to be associated as well with British cultural supremacy, right? We have Encyclopedia Britannica, British birds and flowers, British uh, flowers, birds and beasts. We got Froods, English in the West Indies. Now this is a particularly important test for him to be holding on to because we, I asked you guys to read this, but it was when I had my second COVID shot, so we didn't really get to go over it. Um, this is the one in which uh, James Anthony Froude, the British historian, was arguing that black people in the Caribbean didn't need freedom from Britain, right? 
that they were happy and childlike and best to be left as they were under good British governance, right? So Froude's English in the West Indies is a pretty deeply racist text, which is, you know, like, like if the Encyclopedia Britannica and British Flowers, Birds, and Beasts weren't already kind of markers of British cultural supremacy here, right? Froude's English in the West Indies is the dead giveaway. Which can be easily coupled with Mr. Sawyer's attitude towards his wife, right? What do we know about his treatment of his wife? Why does he treat his wife so poorly? Because she's got gold. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, she, she must have been very pretty once, but with one thing or another, that was in days gone by. But he, it's not her age that he's always harping on, right? What does he abuse her for publicly? Yeah, yeah, Mrs. Sawyer is black. And yet we're told that she is decent, respectable, and nicely educated, right? So better educated and more respectable than he is. And yet this isn't enough to protect her from abuse at this guy's hands, right? So even a decent, respectable, nicely educated black woman ranks lower in the social hierarchy here than a drunken working class white man, right? And how does she respond to his abuse? While he's alive, anyway. Just nervously goes along with it. Yeah, she doesn't say anything or fight back, right? But it might be a stretch to say she goes along with it. Right? <laughs> like, I thought that she was just, like, when the boy that said she just lost it all. Uh-huh. But the servants notice something in her expression, right? That none of the white people at the dinner party do, right? If we go to page seven. Say she was like the equivalent of a female vampire. Yeah, they they they, they call her like a sucreon, right? So a sucreon in um in um Caribbean folklore um is a kind of combination vampire and sorceress. So she doesn't publicly do anything about what her husband does here, right? So page 723 here, right? The story went that once they had ventured to give a dinner party and that when the servant, Mildred, was bringing in coffee, he had pulled Mrs. Sawyer's hair not a wig, you see, he bawled. Even then, if you can believe it, Mrs. Sawyer had laughed and tried to pretend that it was all part of the joke, this mysterious, obscure, sacred English joke. But Mildred told the other servants in the town that her eyes had gone wicked, like a sucreon's eyes, and that afterwards she had picked up some of the hair he had pulled out and put it in an envelope, and that Mr. Sawyer ought to look out. Hair is obeya as well as hands. So, what are the servants saying she's done? There's a sort of nod to witchcraft. Yeah. That, you know, maybe Mr. Sawyer's death isn't really an accident, right? That she has ways of getting back at him. Right, she gathers up some of his hair in an envelope, or some of the hair he pulled out and put in an envelope, and that yeah, that you know she can use that to work spells, right? So, <clears throat> she 
she is associated on the one hand with good naturedly laughing off um, her husband's nasty comments, right? And just kind of taking it. Right, it says on uh, page uh, you know, 723, um, just above that, right, it says, You damned, long eyed, gloomy half caste, you don't smell right, he would say. And she never answered, not even to whisper, You don't smell right to me either. So she doesn't respond verbally, but she has these other avenues, right? It's association with, with magic. So for her, right, what might the destruction of the books represent? Why does she need to destroy all of these books that her husband has been collecting? It's in conclusion. Yeah. This is a way of getting back at him after his death, right? By designating these cultural objects he valued that are themselves kind of encoded with ideas of British, like encoded with, for her anyway, with ideas of British supremacy. By selling the ones that look good and burning the ones that don't, right? She's not just burning these informational works either, right? We've got, you know, the poems of Lord Byron, the poetical works of Milton. We've got a book by Christina Rossetti, right? So she's burning literature as well. She's burning poetry as well. And the daffodils, being Wordsworth's favorite flower, are also a kind of reference to English poetry. But what has she not reckoned with in her destruction of the books? Who feels that the books belong to him now? Yeah. Her son. Whose attitudes towards this culture inherit cultural inheritance are a little more complicated, right? On the one hand, what are we told Eddie looks like? Yeah, he's blonde hair, blue eyed, and we're also that he's very pale, right? I thought he was like a mirror image of his father. Yeah, that he looks like Mr. Sawyer. He's a small, thin boy. You could see the blue veins in his wrists and temples, right? So his skin is quite pale. Yeah, people said that he had the consumption and wasn't long for this world. Yeah. Yeah, he may. Yeah, he may be. Yeah, he may be suffering for, from tuberculosis. Right. So he is um, a pale, thin, sickly child who looks like his father, but also carries his mother's veins, or his mother's blood and racial heritage in his veins, right? Now there's another thing that is, that, you know, apart from the love of the books, there's another thing that associates him with his father, and this might be a kind of minor thing, right? But what, is, what does he look like uh, at the end of the story? What's he wearing at the end of the story when they steal the books? Did anybody notice? Top of page 726. Sailor suit. Yeah, he was white as a ghost in his sailor suit, right? A blue-white even in the setting sun. His father's sneer was clamped on his face. 
And remember that his father works for a shipping company, right? And this notion, um, I think, of sailors having been part of, and you know, you know, a major part of, you know, completely complicit in the triangular trade, right, indicates the complicated nature of Eddie's heritage here, right? He's half white, half black, half English, half Dominican. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, mean, I think that the, the idea of the ghost too, right? Let's think for a second about what a ghost is. Right? What is a ghost? Person who's dead who's like still tied to the earth for some reason. Okay, yeah. So yeah, it, it's yeah, like a vestige of a dead person, right? That remains on earth. Good. What's the vestige? Yeah, so like, like a vestige is just like, like a small part, right? So like the person doesn't physically remain alive, wandering around on the earth, right? That would be something, you know, like more like a ghoul or a zombie. But a ghost, yeah, it's like, like the physical body is falling away, like, you know, some part of the person's, you know, soul or spirit or whatever remains behind, right? So a ghost is, in a lot of ways, a kind of um, animate memory, right? It's a memory that manifests itself somehow in the physical world, right? So he's white as a ghost in his sailor suit, right? And I think that the ghost that we're seeing here is not just the ghost of his father, but the ghost of this complicated and exploitative relationship between Britain and its island colonies, between Britain and Africa. Um, and you know this kind of this memory of British naval supremacy that by you know by the 1940s or so when the story is taking place um, is long past, right? Britain's um, glory as a naval power is something that belongs primarily to the 18th and 19th centuries. So I think what like kind of like in Eddie's in the way Eddie is represented here, like all of these things are contained, right? He was white as a ghost in a sailor suit, a blue white even in the setting sun, and his father's sneer was clamped on his face. Now I think it's also important here to note which two books the children have stolen from the library. What did Eddie grab? Yeah. Yes. Eddie has grabbed a book by Rudyard Kipling called Kim. Are any of you familiar with, with this book? Does anybody know the plot of Kim or what it's, what it's basically about? Oh, so, okay, so Kim is um, an adventure novel about an Irish orphan who has been stranded in India who is trying to negotiate between European Asian identities, right? So it's a story essentially like about a boy from the British Isles who's never been there 
His parents are dead. His father was an army officer. Um, and he's trying to figure out, with the help of various British and you know, native South Asian mentors, um, who he is and where he belongs in the world, right? So the book seems really kind of analogous to and symbolic of Eddie's own situation as a mixed race uh, British boy growing up in the Caribbean, right? And what's disappointing about the condition of the book when he grabs it? The first few pages are missing. Yeah. The first 19 pages, the beginning of the book has been torn out, right? So he doesn't know where to start, right? It begins in the middle of the story. It's missing at least the introductory chapter. So we can say, you know, maybe something here about obscure origins. That might be something to, to come back to here. Now, what about the narrator? What about the book she grabs? French novel called Fort Command. Yes. She, yeah, a book about death. And I think that there are other issues at play here, which I think it's actually pretty significant. Not only, as you noted, that she grabs a book about death, but what language is it in? It's in French. And what has she claimed about herself? So it would be more interesting to be Spanish or French. Yep. And then she is a little bit, right? Would she rather be French or Spanish than English? Yeah. She would rather be French or Spanish than English. Or so she says, right? But what's her reaction to this French book that she's picked up? She can't read it. Yeah, she can't read it, and it seems dull, right? So she's disappointed in what she's grabbed, right? This idea of a French or Spanish identity that she's invented for herself turns out to be disappointing to her, right? So both of them grab seemingly at random, right, books that appear to be relevant to themselves, or at least they're, kind of, they're constructions of themselves, right? But neither of them find what they've grabbed here from the library helpful. The narrator who wants to invent a more exotic origin for herself has grabbed something that would reflect those more exotic origins, but she's, she's unhappy with it. It's, it's not what she really wanted. And Eddie grabs something that is a reminder of his own kind of weird uh, halfway situation, right? So they I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Oh, they subconsciously got books that reflected themselves. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's also important that they've essentially saved both of these books from wreckage, right? They've saved these two books from being destroyed. So there's kind of like some element of preservation of some part of themselves here, right? But the parts of themselves they get from Mr. Sawyer's library 
end up being dissatisfying, or at least the self-definition they get from Mr. Sawyer's books. Um, which are primarily, apart from the poetry books, about definition and categorization, right? In addition to being books that you know promote a kind of British cultural supremacy, these are all books that are about description, definition, and organizing things into categories. And the categories they pull from the library don't really feel like they fit, right? Now, I think it's also um, important to note what book they tend to use in their imaginative play. What's the book that they keep going back to when they're playing? What does their little pretend game look like? We'll look on page 724 near the bottom here. Right? Hot days seem to make him feel especially energetic. Now we'll run twice around the lawn, and then you can pretend you're dying of thirst in the desert, and that I'm an Arab chieftain bringing you water. You must drink slowly, he would say, for if you're very thirsty and you drink quickly, you die. So I learned the voluptuousness of drinking slowly when you are very thirsty, small mouthful by small mouthful until the glass of pink iced Coca-Cola was empty. So they're using um, the uh, resources available to them, right? The you know, glass of Coca-Cola as you know, the water, right? which I think is also a reference to um, one of the basic purposes of many of the Caribbean colonies, right? What was, what was it they were supposed to be growing on these places? Sugar, Sugar yeah, it was the primary ca cash crop, yeah. And in 1960, when the story was published, Coca-Cola was still made primarily with cane sugar. But what is it Eddie is pretending to be? In their little game. What's his role in their little imaginative drama? He is an Arab chieftain bringing water. Yeah, he's pretending to be an Arab chieftain bringing water. And this isn't the first reference to Middle Eastern culture here, all right? They also mention um, Tales from Arabian Nights. Yeah, that's the book they go to the library to borrow from uh, Mr. Sawyer, right? They go to borrow the Arabian Nights. So does anybody remember from our conversation several weeks ago what Orientalism is? Study of Asian cultures. Yeah. On the one hand, yeah, it was the academic study of Asian cultures. Good. But it also marks a cultural tendency of projection, right? In particular, 
the European tendency to project certain ideas and values onto an Asian other, right? Now, a lot of these uh, values are strictly negative, right? For example, if the Englishman sees himself as industrious, he sees uh, the Asian as lazy, right? If the Englishman sees himself as chaste, he sees the Asian as promiscuous. Um, if he sees himself as sophisticated and worldly, he sees the Asian as naive and childlike, right? But there's also a strong association in the 19th and 20th centuries in the European imagination between the East uh, and uh, fantasy, right? So <laughs> Asia for the British public and not just the British public, but you know the French, the Germans, the Americans as well, right? Becomes this kind of realm of exotic fantasy, and we still see this um, going into um, even you know the 21st century. I don't know if any of you remember um, a movie based on a video game from the early 2000s called called Prince of Persia, um, which trafficked in a lot of these same tropes. Um, you know, like the the East is represented in terms of you know. Um, you know, evil wizards with dastardly powers, um, you know, bold but naive heroes, uh, beautiful princesses whose veils reveal as much as they conceal, right? Things of that nature. I mean, even, you know, Disney's Aladdin arguably traffics in some of these kinds of tropes. And in fact, I know that, um, you know, the uh, Arab American Anti-Defamation League, when that movie came out in the 90s, had some real issues uh, with the way Arabs were portrayed in the movie. But the idea here, I think, is escapism, right? That by <clears throat> adopting this kind of Middle Eastern fantasy identity, right? by engaging in this Arabian Nights-based fantasy play, the narrator and Eddie can thus escape from, to some extent, the contradictions of their own heritage, right? By pretending to be something else. Right? Let's play at being something else because we can't resolve what it is that we are easily or cleanly. So do you guys have anything else that you want to say about this? Like, are there any questions about this story or anything you want to point out here? I mean, it's pretty ridiculously short, right? It's only about four pages long, but there's still a lot you can mine here. Um, so, all right, if you guys don't have anything else, I'm guessing by your signs, is that a hand up or are you just clicking your pen? Ah. Oh. <laughs> um, then I'll give you the reading questions for next time, and uh, we'll have um, Hannah and Aaron give their presentation on Wednesday, yes?